I'm talking about the mic. Oh, there we go. All right. Very good. Very good. Well, good morning, everyone. Smaller number. We were hoping that our members know that we actually are going to have Sabbath school and church today and so forth. Kelly, who's uh, new with us today, good to have you with us. And uh, she's from Phoenix. I think really she's from Hawaii because she was smiling when she came in and so forth. But uh, we're glad to have you with us. But uh, she said the website's down. Is the website down? Right? And so forth. Did you, uh, I don't know if George works on that or not, but uh, whatever. So anyway, good to have you with us this morning. We're going to be talking about a bad king today. And it has nothing to do with politics this morning. But we're talking about King Ahaz. And um, we're talking about Isaiah. And if you, we've studied the book of Isaiah for, what, what, two or three weeks now? Maybe a little longer. And uh, one of the greatest prophets of the Old Testament, according to many scholars, was Isaiah. And so his relationship and his relationship with Ahaz, who was the king of Judea, is rather interesting. It's, in the third, it's a third king during the time or the life of Isaiah. You know, Uriah was the first king, and he was a good king. And his son Joash also was a good king. However, Ahaz was not, and so forth. So what we're going to talk about today is, if you take a look at the screen there, is that you would say, or wouldn't you guess, that we are in the Advent age. Would that be true? The Advent, the age, or the last days. Is that true? Okay, and we've heard that, uh, you know, have you ever heard the saying, if you cry wolf long enough and he doesn't show up, what happens? Do you think that happens maybe as we talk about the second coming? Do you think that uh, because we put so much emphasis on it that people will all of a sudden just become conditioned to it? What do you think? Does that apply or does it not apply? We certainly wouldn't want to stop talking about the second coming, right? That's our hope. If there is, as Paul said, if there's no resurrection, we're to be pitied above all men, right? So that'd be true of the second coming. Well, let me, uh, let's take a look at some text here. And this is from uh, uh, the book of Isaiah. And he says, uh, And I will wait for the Lord who is hiding his face of the house of Jacob, I will even look eagerly for him. So what's Isaiah saying here? You've probably studied the lesson this week, and so hopefully, and so forth. What is Isaiah saying here? It almost sounds like God is you know, being not available. All right. All right, really good, really good representation. So, good morning, Robert and Patsy. You know, I forgot what they look like. I always see them with their masks on all the time, so I have no clue now. So if we had to do an identity check, I think I'd be in trouble. Oh my God, no <laughs> we would never know, Bob. All right, so what we see here is Isaiah saying, hey, I don't have to be like the rest of the people. I don't have to be like King Ahaz. I can have hope, right? Let's look at some of the other translations here. Well, it says, and I will wait for the Lord. The uh, New Living uh, Testament, the English Standard Version, and the New King James Version says this, I will put my hope in him. I like the NIV translation in this one, taken from the 1984 edition, which says this, I will put my trust in him regardless of what transpires around me. What do you think? I think we're in that age today. Uh... I was thinking the other day as we were kind of looking at the events over just the last year and to see how many things we can load on here. Uh, COVID-19, I'm taking that out of my dictionary. Uh, every time I hear that, it sounds like spinach. Same type of correlation. Okay, number two, unemployment. Number three, anger. Character assassination. Is that what we hear? If we disagree with someone, we don't just disagree. We go after them, and we try to hurt them. Is that what we're showing today? Okay. I don't think anybody would argue with that. You see it every day. You hear it every day. No wonder people are nasty. You hear it long enough, and what happens? By beholding, we become changed. Have you noticed, and feel free to speak up on this, have you noticed your dispositions changing because of the events of just the last 12 months? 
Have you experienced in your heart where you feel, you know, I, I, I'm, you know I'm, I'm not the same as I was. I don't act the same. I don't treat people the same. Have you had that thought? Has that come across in your mind? Not that you've actually outwardly done that, but you're more angry than you used to be. You're more upset than you used to be. You might be more discouraged than you've ever been. Have you experienced that? I see people saying, mm-hmm. So the first thing I did in order to deal with that was to turn off the news. Boy, what a wonderful thing that was, right? To turn the news off and so forth. And I think that the Lord says we should be thinking on things that are pure and good. Uh, Does that mean that we should stop being informed? What do you think? All right. I would agree. Okay. Uh, it looks like we get about one minute of news and 29 minutes of editorials. Would you agree? It used to be the other way around. Back in the 50s, that's 1950, some people get that confused. We used to have the news where we'd have Walter Cronkite on for 25 minutes, and then there was a guy named Eric Severide. How many remember him? Okay. And every, he would give the editorial. So the last four minutes, we got at basically an editorial, an opinion on what the news was saying. Uh, today, it's kind of reversed, right? And so forth. So it affects us. So in the days of Ahaz, we're going to talk about this morning, are some things that we need to understand about faith that we can pull out of this lesson. In the days of Ahaz, the country's a mess. I mean, we'll read a few things of what was going on then. And Ahaz was one of the worst kings, with the exception of maybe Manasseh, of Judea. Do you know that many scholars feel that there wasn't one good king? Ahaz or Ahab? Ahaz. Did I say Ahab? All right. Ahaz. Thank you for the correction. Yeah, we don't want to get them in. There is a difference. Well, maybe there wasn't really much of a difference. The two of them were both bad. So I guess the correlation's okay. So anyway, the idea is Isaiah was surrounded by evil just like you and I are today. So should, we should be able to take something from this lesson about how to deal with that. Okay? So um, we're going to talk about faith this morning and two basic components of faith. Okay, which is one is pursuing God, and number two is fear. A pastor gave a sermon on fear about six or seven weeks ago, and he said, you know what? The sacrificial lamb, the lamb that was slain, it was here in Revelation. He brought that up. But then he brought this thing up about he's also the lion of Judea. And, you know, that's been a, an issue for me most of my life, trying to understand this idea of fear. The three angels' message basically says, fear God. Now, here's the key to that. What's the rest of it? Fear God for his judgment is what? Come. He ties up fear with judgment. Right? That's part of the three angels' message. All right. So we're going to talk about that. Because Ahaz made a lot of decisions based on what? What was his motive for many of the decisions that he made? Fear. Fear. Okay? All right. Let's talk about faith real quick. Two examples. The lesson gave a lesson of a little girl, 10 years old, standing on the fourth floor on a ledge or at a window of a burning building. Apparently an apartment building. The firemen could not get a ladder truck between the two buildings, so they put out a net and asked the girl to jump. And her response was, I don't think so. Just like probably mine would be. Pardon? She was blind. She, thank you very much. She was blind. we got two people who will keep me honest here. So, She was blind. So obviously she couldn't see the net. And so her father came. And he told her it was okay. Go ahead and jump. Story goes on that she did. Because she trusted him you know it's one thing to talk about faith 
It's another one to implement that. Wouldn't you believe? Wouldn't you agree with that? We talk about faith, but sometimes when we look at ourselves, our faith doesn't hold up sometimes in times when we have to make difficult decisions. Ahaz had to make some difficult decisions. The other one is one you've heard many times about the acrobat who put a rope across Niagara Falls, had a wheelbell, and he was going to wheel it across, right? So he asked the crowd two questions. He says, number one, how many of you think that I can make it across? Everybody raised their hand. Yeah, not a problem. Then he said, how many of you would like to volunteer to get into the wheelbell? Uh, all of a sudden, the enthusiasm waned. <laughs> <laughs> we can understand that, right? It's easy to talk about. It's a lot tougher to implement. All right. So let's go on here. And this is, I think, one of the key texts of the Bible. There are many. For faith is, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. For we must believe that he exists that he is real to us. So if you think about Jesus and the ten virgins, you remember the five, uh, out, they all fell asleep. But when the groom came, five were ready, five were not. When the five that were not went out were looking for the oil, they come to the house where the wedding party was. They knock on the door, and what does the Lord say to them? Why did he not let them in? I don't know you. And that's the real key to why we're here today and why we study God. God takes those people to heaven who know him. Agree? Okay, so the text goes on to say not only that he exists, that means he's real to us. We know him because we've experienced him. When it says we have to believe that he exists, is that he is really part of our life. We are getting to know him. He lives with us through all of the good times and bad times in life. And then it says this, and he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So let's remember that text as we go along. Here's a question. True faith in God has both the components of fear and a desire to seek God. How do we build a trust that can be stronger than fear? So let's take some text here. We'll talk about Uzziah. And Uzziah was 16 years old and became king. He reigned in Jerusalem for 52 years. His mother's name was Jechaliah. She was from Jerusalem. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, just as his father Amaziah had done. He sought God during the days of Zechariah, who instructed him in the fear of God. Now, what's key about the fear of God? There's something there instructed him in the fear of God. What does that mean? Well, there's a certain fear there because he is so all powerful. Okay. And, and, and you know, the God things are black and white. Either you're with me or you're against me. And if, if you know God, you don't want to be against him. So you're fearful. Okay. Well, basically it says this, that was one of his attributes, is that he feared God. Now, I've told you this story before, and some of you who are new here have not heard this, about when my wife was babysitting two young boys. Uh, they, had, they had no father, he had left the family, and he had a mother who was trying to work two jobs and take care of these children. So she needed, of course, child care, so... My wife, who was staying home at the time, because we had two small boys, uh, brought those two boys in. One boy was 10, the other was about 5. And every time his brother would leave the room, he would almost go into convulsions. He would scream, he would cry, he would, I, I'm, I can't explain how bad that was. Is that the kind of fear that God's talking about? Ah, who said no? Okay. Father also instructed him. 
Okay. What was wrong with this boy? Why was he so afraid? What was the issue that created this fear? And his brother would leave the room, and sometimes his brother would do it deliberately just to see what his brother would do. Sounds kind of cruel. As young people, we can be cruel sometimes. What was the problem with the boy? What was he lacking? What was killing him? Mother's never home, for good reason. Okay? He has his brother. Pardon? Security. Security. He did not have any security. Is that what God's talking about when he says you should fear him? That we can never count on him? We can never trust him? Is that what it's talking about? I think this text is saying this. Look, your idea of fear is not what I mean. Because it says here that, uh, that, uh, that Uzziah was instructed in the fear of God. He was teaching you what fear really means in a Christian relationship. Not the way it means when we live a, a life in this world and we're afraid of losing our job and this kind of thing. That's not it at all. Yes. You know, if you look at Billy's Bible Dictionary, you'll get this kind of a definition. Reverence, extreme reverence, profound, awesome reverence for God. That's as close as we can get, I think. Okay, I'm trying to explain what this means. But there are other texts that will help us. Now, the second part of this was seeking God. I did two things. He knew the fear of God, and he pursued God. That is the definition we find in Hebrews 11.6. Okay? Ahaz did neither. He was more afraid of the nations that surrounded him than he was of God. He was more concerned about what the nations could do to him than what the boundaries in a relationship with God. Which tells me he had no faith. And he bought his way out of trouble. Did you want to elaborate on that? That's right. Good decision. Yeah. Ahaz says, wait a minute. Um, I'm in trouble. I'm not going to go to God. I'm going to give money to Assyria to destroy these nations. So Assyria goes in. They destroy Damascus. Ahaz goes over there and looks at the destruction that he bought and sees this altar. And he takes and has a model of that altar put in the in the temple up to this God that wasn't able to save Damascus, right? Right. And then while that's happening, since he paid Assyria off, Assyria says, well, they got money, huh? Yeah. Uh, let's go after them and sure. destroy them. And at first, Assyria was all the happy in the world because they wanted to go after Syria and they wanted to go after Israel. Fine. That's yeah. part of the plan, right? So at first, it sounded good. And if you were Ahaz neglecting God now, and leaving it up to your own judgment to make a decision, you're saying, well, let's see here. Why would I fear Israel, and why should I fear Syria? When Assyria, I should say uh, <laughs> Syria, Syria and Israel, why should I fear them when Assyria is a rising power? I think that's, that's the best choice. Well, maybe in human wisdom, it was. But in reality, it wasn't. And we'll find out why, because God in his love and his patience for people, including Ahaz, came and gave him a break. Came to make him a promise that that's not going to happen. And then we'll get into some signs that he wanted to give Ahaz so Ahaz could have confidence that when God spoke, you could trust him. He hadn't given up on Ahaz. Something that we need to remember. Okay. 
Let's take a look. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge of God. I want you to remember that's an important text when you talk about fear. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. So when I first came to Christ and made my decision for him, was it based upon love? Well, I guess it depends how you interpret that. Okay, uh, we would call that if you had a relationship when you were in high school or in college before you find your, found your wife, or maybe she would have been the one. They called it, and they called it puppy love. <laughs> Remember that song? And so forth. It was something that was not deep. It was surface. But you accepted it by faith, even though you had an awful lot to learn. Isn't that right? And so many people, basically, will have, Look at this idea of hellfire and being destroyed. Regardless of your belief on the state of the dead, ultimately, death is what's going to happen for those who are not in Christ. So, I had a guy who was giving a Bible study to him and his family, and we were talking about the state of the dead. And he said, I want to tell you something, Chuck. He said, the only reason I'm a Christian is because I want to avoid hell. And we had been studying for a long time. And I looked at him and I said, and I felt I should have said this. I said, that's not good enough. And it isn't, is it? To serve God because I want to avoid hell. How horrible. Now, you may come to Christ that way. And God says, well, that's the beginning of knowledge. Let's finish it. In this way, and this comes from the Berean Study Bible, Love has been perfected among us so that we may have confidence on the day of judgment. In the three angels' message, we fear God because of what? The judgment. Is that what it says? But what does it say here? Pardon? I'm sorry to hear you. Confidence. God isn't saying, I want you to fear the judgment. So that's what it says in the three angels' message. He's telling people outside of the Christian family there's going to be a judgment. And when we get to Isaiah, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Oh, I don't want to get to that yet. That, that just kill. We'll get back to that in a minute. God wants us to have confidence in the day of judgment. Isn't that true? He says when we come before the throne of grace, he said, would it come what? Hesitantly? What? Boldly. God wants us to have confidence in him. As parents, isn't that what we want from our children? Do we want them to serve because they're scared to death that we're going to beat them to death? Sure, we have guidelines. And with God, fear is guidelines that he puts because he wants to protect us, not hurt us, right? He cares for us. Ahaz didn't see that. Most of the world doesn't either. Let's finish it. There is no fear in what? Love. And remember that. But perfect love drives out fear. Now here's the kind of fear that it drives out, drives out. Because fear involves what? God says, if you're following me because of fear of punishment, that isn't good enough. I don't want you to serve because you don't think I care for you. I don't want you to serve me because you think I'm hard. Now, Satan's the idea. Is that what that text is saying? The one who fears has not been what? Perfected in love. Now, I'll ask you. Are there times in your life that you have fear that you're not ready? I have. And I will tell you from day one to day two, I have confidence in God through faith, but there are times when I have doubts. How about you? And we're going to talk about how God deals with that because he doesn't want you to have doubts. He doesn't want you to have guilt. He wants you to deal with it, and we'll see how he does that as we go through. We just saw that. Uh, as we go through the conversion experience, and when I say conversion, not necessarily of being godly, but a conversion of experience to a new role that God has for us. In this case, Jeremiah, Isaiah, Peter, and all of those. They saw God in person or heard him in person. And there was a result. 
there was a fear. But what did that fear come from? That's the key. Was it fear of punishment or was it fear of something else? Let's look at this. Therefore, you kings, Psalms 2, 10 through 12, be wise, be warned, your rulers of the earth, serve the Lord with fear and separate his rule. With trembling, kiss his son who will be angry and, you, and will lead to destruction of the wrath that can flare up in a moment. Blessed are those who take refuge in him. Someone that you're scared to death of, you don't take refuge in. God is good. Nahum 1 7 says. He is a refuge in time of trouble. He cares for those who trust in him. Okay? All right. Let's take Isaiah 6 1. He sees God sitting on the throne in this huge train, okay, of his robe, and it fills the temple. He touches the earth in his power and his glory, and his earth and the early temple cannot contain him. He was an awestruck. I mean, I can't imagine that, but when we see like Isaiah saw, we see this awesome God that there's just no comparison between him and me, between him and you. And he's just awestruck. He can't hardly take that in. Do you think in our Christian experience, we do experience something like Isaiah? Have you experienced something like that? Something to think about. I don't think this was meant just for Isaiah. It's meant for all of us. We're sometimes amazed, are we not, how God intervenes for us. To me, that's the amazing thing. In our life daily, when we pray about something, and we see God intervening for us. We need that. We need that personal experience. The experience of Isaiah. Okay, here we have Isaiah. Now, we, he was already called, but this was to call for a special responsibility as a prophet. And here's what he says. Woe to me, I am ruined. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. He touched my mouth and said, This has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin is atoned for. What is this text telling us? First of all, what was the problem that Isaiah had in regard to God? Why did he say woe to me? You realize how fallen he is. Oh. God was perfect in righteousness, not only awesome. And God see that. And he couldn't go any further. He said, I can't, I can't hardly deal with this. And God said, you know what? I know what the problem is, and I'm going to deal with it right now. Right now. So what does he do? It says here, this seraphim, which could be some kind of an angel. It's not an angel second class like Clarence was, but maybe a higher form of an angel. We don't know. And what does he do? Isaiah didn't ask for it. He gave it to him. He puts his tongs on his lips so that he what? Get rid of his guilt complex to give him his righteousness from a legal perspective. Because he knew that Isaiah could not function in his job that he was asking him to do. And this he knew he had a right relationship with God and he got that by faith. Because God gave it to him. Yes. Okay. Between, um, I, I love this example of when, when you have a professor that has studied his entire life and he reaches the end of his education, he reaches towards the end of his life and he looks at the vast balance of his sin and how little he's learned and he says, I know nothing. That's different than somebody that first goes to college and says, I know nothing, there is nothing to learn, right? This is the difference between somebody that has gone through Isaiah's experience and says, woe is me, I am unclean, or a Christian that says, well, grace is free, we don't need to do anything, we don't need to have that heart-wrenching experience of, I am guilty, I need to be free. Until we, you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, let, I, let me try to summarize what you're saying, and correct me if I'm wrong. When we become Christians... First of all, in order to live the Christian life, we must be righteous in God's sight. It's just that simple. 
The Bible says you may not must be perfect, and it's talking more than about maturity. When judgment, when we talk about the judgment, which is a positive thing for Christians, the Bible tells us there is no judgment for those who are in Christ, okay? Is that God needs you to know that you're part of his family, and to be part of his family, we may be as righteous as he is. That's impossible physically to live through. So God says, you know what? Legally in my book, I've taken care of it. And he did that right at the beginning of Isaiah's ministry. Okay, and now let's say if, see if this is similar to Jeremiah and, and, and Peter. It's the same experience. Let's go to another one. This is about Moses. We won't have time to go all through it. But it says, let's just take the first part. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, remember the burning bush, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses, and Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer. Take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy ground. You are standing in the place of a righteous and perfect God. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And what did Moses do? He hid his face. Woe unto me. Same issue. Okay? So for us as Christians, as we once came to Christ, so walk in him, we'll have this experience over and over again is that we will constantly see ourselves unfit for the kingdom. It's that balance between legalism and sheep. Yes, and that balance is really the key, isn't it? You could talk grace for a long time and everybody thinks, well, you know, you just said, there's no effort in the Christian life, you just walk through it, right? Which I don't know how he could gain that, but that's the way it is. And then we have the legalist side, that if we work hard enough, we have enough goody points, against minus points, we're fine. But he hid his face. He hid his face. It isn't because God didn't love him. It wasn't because God didn't want to forgive him. God's not willing that any should perish. He cares for us. But to look on a righteous God is an experience as we've seen by our prophets and Moses. And we'll look at Peter here real quick. And I might add, since you brought that up, uh, um, let's take a look at this. The excuses given. Now, Isaiah didn't have one. He said, hey, you need to choose somebody, pick me. Okay? That was not true of most. We look here at Jeremiah. God says, I knew you while you were in the womb. And he says this. He asked him to do something, and he said, Lord, I do not know how to speak. I'm too young. He looked at himself and saw that his lack of being able to perform what God asked him to do. And that's the line between grace and legalism. Grace says, I can't do it. And God said, don't worry about it, I'll take care of it. Remember the definition of faith, Hebrews 1 verse 6. For those who diligently seek him, our work as Christians is to seek God. If we seek God, we will produce fruit. Do you agree with that? That's in harmony with John 15. So I'm too, I'm too young. I can't do it. I don't speak real well, Mark. God said, don't worry about it. We'll deal with it. Well, Moses said the same thing. I don't speak real well. Well, I, you got Aaron here, and he's, an, he's a great orator. We'll use him. He'll speak for you. God has the answer. All right, let's go on. Oh, I love this one. Simon, Peter, and the disciples are out fishing. Fished all night. Not, not a fish, not one. And anyway, Jesus comes up to him and he says, go out deep in the water and throw your nets in. And they've been working all night. And here's what Peter says. Master, we've worked all night and haven't got anything, but because you say so, lesson for us, I'll do it anyway. I got some doubts here, but okay, I'll throw it in. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come. And they came and filled both boats so full they began to sink. What is Peter's response? Boy, I'm really happy about this. This is great. What did he say? Is it the same comment that Isaiah gave? I am a sinful man. Away from me. 
The few came because he looked at God of who he was and he's, he did not measure up. That's the fear that we need to talk about. We always need Jesus in our life. Our fear should be of stopping communicating with him. That's the fear that it's talking about. It's not talking about judgment. Perfect love casts out fear of judgment. When Carol and I became Seventh-day Adventist Christians, and it isn't just Seventh-day Adventists, I saw more people who had no clue as to the destiny of eternal life. In reality, they were scared to death. And my wife, who was already a Christian, looked at that and said, there's something wrong here. There's something desperately wrong here. That very basis of a Christian life is confidence that God has judged us as righteous. That's why in 1 John chapter 5, we're told, you can know if you have eternal life or not. The only condition is that we continue to stay connected, right? Now, how does that deal with Ahaz? Does Ahaz fit any of this? Do we hear his testimony about, I'm a man of unclean lips? We don't hear any of that. That was his problem. It's that simple. Okay. Let's go on. Very quickly, I'm just real quick in Isaiah 11 through 8 to 15. It says, the Lord Almighty is the one you are to regard as holy. He's the one you are to fear, the one you are to dread. We don't need to fear anything else. We just want to make sure that we're in contact with God. Not fearing him because he's going to hurt us, but fearing because of the fact he, can, he is life. If we want life and we want it better and more abundantly, I need to stay tied to him. That should be my fear. When we don't study, when we don't pray, when we don't share, we need to be afraid. Would you agree? And that's what Jesus is trying to say. Hey, look, I'm not here to hurt you. But there are consequences if you don't stay within the guidelines of what it means to be faithful. Any comments? Yes, and then we'll come to Mark. Isn't that the truth? Okay. Hold that point. I want to come back to that. Mark? Yeah, I, just, I don't want to get us off track, but um, going, going back to the whole how unworthy we are type thing, I, I keep thinking of, of John. Yep. Um, you know, in the gospel, he describes himself as the one who Jesus loved. They had a very, very close bond, probably closer than any of the others. Yep. Jesus in his glorified self took off the garb of humanity. Yep. He's still in the form of a human, but the, the divine glorified thing, you know, he's a perfect human as, as Jesus described him. Seeing Jesus in his deity is yeah. different and some like that than in, in, than in his humanity. And yes. It goes back it, in thinking about that coal that came down and touched Isaiah's lips. Um, I can remember when I was a kid, I had a severe bloody nose and I had to have it cauterized. And I think of that coal, it's a similar type thing. It, it purifies and it seals. It's, it's like cauterizing something. It, it burns off the, the, the germs, it, it purifies it, it cleans it, and it seals it. Isaiah, recognizing his unworthiness and his unholiness, God comes down and touches humanity. He cleans it, and then the most important thing in my mind, not only does he clean it, but he seals it. Yes, he does. That's awesome. Yeah. 
And that goes back to the point, which is the second part. I can't do this. I don't speak well. I don't have this. I don't have that. God said, don't worry about it. I'll take care of it. And he, you know, Isaiah was yeah. willing to be cleansed and sealed. Ahaz obviously wasn't because he was pride. Well, it's having that sense, isn't it, that we are. How do we get to that point? How do we have that sense that I'm unworthy? Yes. Yep. No, we certainly don't. If you study your Bible, it will not take very long for you to see how unworthy you really are. Isn't that true? It won't be hard. It'll come across pretty good. And, so, and that's why, and I'm going to go back to this one slide. You say, well, are we going to talk about Ahaz today? Well, we have been talking about him. We have been talking about him. All right, I want you to look at this. I don't want to go back too far, but look at this slide. I kind of like this. And uh, fear has two meanings. Number one, forget everything and run. Sounds like the Garden of Eden, right? Number two is to face everything and rise above it. If we fear about our relationship with God, where do we take it? Take the throne of grace, don't we? We can be honest with God and say, hey, look, you know what? I, uh, you know, I may look good, but I know my heart is not right. And you can go through that process with God. What do you think God's doing? He is the lamb that was slain that is part of our experience. It's, he is the lion of Judea when we walk away from him, as Ahaz did. All right. Remember this, any man that cometh unto me, I'm quoting the King James in this one, any man that cometh unto me, I will in no wise what? Cast out. He just wants us to come to him. Okay, let's go on. Uh, and then we're going to talk about Ahaz very quickly. We're going to have to do it quick. Uh, let's see if there's one other thing I wanted to show you. Yeah, here it is. Fear of God... Look at what's underlined here. Reverence for him is the only kind of fear that brings peace and confidence to all you think and do. It is reverence for God that brings confidence to us. And let's go on. There's another part to that. Ellen White makes a statement in Christ's Odyssey Lessons that the grace of Christ that's reaved in the heart is peace, not fear. It is peace. When we receive Christ, we're comfortable in his presence. The heart that is in harmony with God is a partaker of the peace of heaven and will diffuse its blessed influence on everybody around. The spirit of peace will rest like dew upon hearts and troubled with worldly strife. That's where we're at today. Okay, let's talk about Ahaz. We're going to just summarize it. I hope you've read it. Isaiah comes to Ahaz with his son, and he says this, uh, you afraid of Syria? You afraid of Israel? Don't worry about it. It's not going to happen. Isn't that what he said? It's not going to happen. And then he does something else. He provided and asked Ahaz, would you like a sign to show you that this is going to happen? Isn't that amazing? And what does he say? Oh, I'm not going to test God. You know, false humility, I say, right? He could care less what God had to say. Why? Because he hadn't been associating with them. You know, we think that when the big times come, we'll be ready to deal with God then. But if we're not experiencing him in the little things of life, we will not be ready for the tough ones. What do you think? Right? Okay. What were the two signs? I won't go through this. This is what... Uh, you know, an answer, by the way, uh, that Isaiah gave to uh, Ahaz when he said, oh, I'm not going to test God. Here's what he says. Here now, you house of David, right-hand corner here, it is not enough to try the patience of humans. Will you also try the patience of my God also? God was patient with Ahaz. He's giving an option to try to draw him. And so he gives the two signs anyway. By the way, uh, from Billy Webb and the message of Isaiah, Whatever we rely on, instead of trusting in God, will eventually turn and devour us. Agree? Okay. 
Okay, here's the sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. He'll be eating curds and honey when he knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right. For before the boy knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right, the land of the two kings will be laid to waste. For they will be killed. The year that was given was 734 AD, uh, BC. Excuse me. And so, three years later, Assyria comes in and destroys Damascus, Assyria. And they go in and ravage the land of Israel. Don't completely take it, because Samaria didn't fall until 12 years later. But he said, that's a sign. Now let's take a look at the two signs. Do you think the one about the Messiah is future? Did he have any understanding at all about a Messiah? Did they have temple services in those days? Wouldn't he have some kind of an understanding that there was a Messiah to look forward to? So in this head, from our perspective, what are we looking forward to? The Messiah, the second coming, right? That is a hope. So, yeah. Now, you, it's interesting you say that because in Hebrews, the 11th chapter, it mentions all these people, even through Samson in there, which gives us all some hope, right? And then at the end, he says, none of them received what? Their reward. None of them. And yet they were faithful and so forth. So he's talking, why, what is the deal with the second coming? Paul says, you know, I forget what's in the past when I look forward to the day of Jesus Christ. It was a hope to him. It was a realization that's really going to happen because he knew God. It's going to happen. And it kept him going. It kept him going. If you lose the vision, you lose the war. And in the church when we're here today, we're in our Sabbath school, a, a pastor preaches to us to keep the vision alive and keep the tongs hot, if you know what I mean. All right? Now, let's uh, look at the second part. And uh, by the way, Paul mentions in 1 Timothy, when God was talking to Ahaz, and the second part of that was that a boy would be born to an unmarried woman. Okay? If you married, she would have a son. The first year would be pregnancy, and the next two years, he would come of an age where he could understand or communicate. And he was saying to him in that one, I'm going to prove to you that my word is real. And Paul talks about that in this text. He says this, But for every reason I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his, immediate, his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. That is meant for Ahaz as well as us. Ahaz is the worst of the worst. Maybe Manasseh was worse. But the point was, God was still dealing with him. He was willing to give him a sign so he could gain confidence. He had not given up on him. So, what does that mean for you and me? In the days that we live today of doubt and worry and things falling around us that I have never experienced, that there is still hope. And if our life's not where they ought to be, will join the crowd, or even the prophets. God will make it right if we want him to. All he asks of us, all he ever asks for us, is to stay connected with him. He will provide the power and he will provide the fruit. He asks us to do one thing, as Jesus said. What must I do to be saved? What work must I do that I might be saved, this group of Jews said. What work must I do that I might do the works of God? How can I really be a Christian? There's a work before that. And that's the work that we have to do. Jesus said, your work is to know the one whom the Father has sent. That's our work. What does that mean? God needs us to be acquainted so we study his word. If we're not studying his word, we're not doing the work God's asked us to do. Right? If we're not habitually praying, God wants us to talk to him because we hate him. We need him for cleansing. We need him for power. We want to be a good example for the cause. 
And so Jesus says, keep coming to me. If you're not doing that, folks, we are running a dangerous race and we should be fearful. Would you agree? And so when we look at Ahaz, in your own mind, why did he give those two signs? What was his purpose? To win Ahaz over. Do you agree with that? Is that what the text is saying? I think it is. All right, let's go on. Okay, so here it is. The prophecy has a double fulfillment. It's taken from the NIV commentary. One, of course, is Mary, a maiden woman, unmarried, has a child, conceived by the Holy Spirit. And she bores a son, Emmanuel. But the second part is an immediate fulfillment about, and this is what, we don't know for sure here, but this is according to the NIV commentary. The immediate fulfillment was a young woman from the house of Ahaz was not married and would marry and have a son. Before three years passed, one for pregnancy and two for the child to be old enough to talk, the two invading kings would be destroyed. Ahab would live to see that. So what did he do with it? A living sign. What did he do with it? Well, pretty much like Ahaz in a business suit. And that's the steps he was taking, and he was about ready to fall to the gutter. It seems like, if you look at the second paragraph here, in the NIV, 2 Kings 16, then King Ahaz went to Damascus to meet with the king of Assyria. And Dan's already made reference to that. In essence, what did he do? Paid him off, number one. Invited him in to protect him. He could have asked God for that. Okay? But he didn't do that because he didn't trust him. And so how does that relate to us as we close with this question? How does that relate to us? You to summarize that. What is this lesson telling us? Not all shy. you fall in as long as you get in a ditch focus on me okay by beholding we become changed or focus on me yes that's right okay if you hear that we have a choice to trust God but that choice is not saying, I'm going to trust him now. Trust is taking time with him in prayer and study of the word. And the saying again, if you don't like reading the Bible, get a translation that you can understand. That's number one. We have plenty of good translations. I'm not talking about paraphrases, but good translations. And there are many of them. Get a Bible that you can understand. God's device in this world and the world before was to get translations in the hands of people that they did not understand or not give them Bibles at all. If he, can, if he can do that, he's accomplished his goal. Number two, spend time in prayer. And no, no, prayer is not easy sometimes. But if we practice and we sense God's presence, and you will, and pray about the little things in your life, the meeting you got next tomorrow. God, help me to get through that. What a wonderful thing it is. But he just seems to take that. God wants those experiences because that's how you build your faith. Would you agree? So we can live his life. Somebody had their hand up. Bob, and then we're going to close. Yeah, I think in a modern sense, <coughs> the time factor is critical. And turn off the TV or phone and read and listen. Okay. Without spending time, you're not going to learn. We got time now. If you're spending time at home, you've got time to spend time in the wood, right? and so forth. Let's bow our heads. Thank you very much for your assistance today. Our Father, we give thanks that we can boldly come before the throne of grace. Our prayer is that we know our condition. There is not one here that doesn't need your righteousness and your goodness, your instruction, your love, your kindness. We pray today for that very thing, that in the world we live today, and especially in the world that we live, 
that we'll take into consideration that we need to spend time with you. That is the gust of the Christian experience we know. We give thanks for your patience with us as you will with Ahaz. And give us the strength again to continue to pursue you. And we ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Thank you very much.